So Chris was right and Chris was wrong. That's okay. Um, he's right. It's by the time we get to this point in the uh, in the sequence of studies, a lot of the same things have come up over and over again. In fact, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego have come up several times. And in fact, the first lesson, Chris hit the punchline, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a faith that was unwavering, but it was not a faith that said, God's going to do it just the way I want to do it. He said, they said, even if God doesn't save us, we will not serve your gods. And that is the real bottom line when we look at this, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So where he's not quite right is, I'm not going to do the third chapter. I'm going to do the first through the fourth chapter. And we're going to talk about a number of things this evening. But uh, it's good to see everybody out. Uh, I have really enjoyed this series, and I hope that you guys have too. There's a, there's a number of reasons why I've enjoyed it, but the Probably the primary reason is because it is so timely for our time, you know. We have a really strange world right now, and uh, fear, angst, has been politicized, and uh, it's been commercialized, and uh, the word unprecedented has been used so many times that uh, it's getting worn out a little bit. But if you think about it, um, those things are all part of causing us or encouraging us to think in a particular way, okay? We are encouraged to look at, well, even things like, oh, well, I have a, well, you know, I don't look quite, oh, that stresses me, I better, and so we have, a, there's angst among uh, all kinds of people, but youth particularly, about where they fit and how they fit in, and it's a struggle. And we, they, we stress about our health, we stress about the climate. Uh, both political parties say, hey, you know, if they, if they take over, you know, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be really bad. And so there's this, this kind of aura, and, uh, what it comes down to, everybody's kind of running in place sometimes and going, we're all going to die, we're all going to die, we're all going to die, you know? And then, you know, you go, yeah, what's your point? We are all going to die. That's what we're going to do. I mean, that is it. Ever since the Duke Garden, we're all going to die. So what are we going to do with that? Okay. What are we going to do with that? Because we can live our lives in, in several different ways. In Ecclesiastes, uh, this was addressed when we talked about Ecclesiastes. I mean, you can live in uh, despair. And uh, Solomon got to that point when he was looking at just the world without God. And he came to despair. Or you can live it in, a, in, a, in, a, in avoidance. You can just put on your blinders and say, well, maybe I'm not going to die. I'm going to just do what I need to do to feel good and enjoy the moment, and we can li live just in, a, in avoidance. And we see that happening all around us. Or we can live in a, a state of hope, and that is what we have that lifts us to a better place. And it is what everybody out there wants, okay? What everybody out there wants is not to be afraid. They want to fear not, but they fear. It is the natural state of our being, is to be afraid. And we look for a savior. We look for a consolation, and we look for it in different, in different places. So anyway, um, whoa. Turning, turning to um, the uh, stories that we see in the uh, book of Daniel, what we see is there's five main characters, Shadrach, or D Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, 
And who's the fifth one? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, okay? There's these five main characters. And this, these chapters from one to four are not really four or five stories that are individually uh, pulled out, okay? That is the way we tend to look at them, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, when we, when we teach children's classes, we teach a class, and we talk about the fiery furnace because it's, it's a discrete piece of the story. And, you know, my favorite is chapter 2 where he, we get the description of the, um, the image that Nebuchadnezzar sets up because I like the part, uh, I like the fact that it so clearly delineates what's going to happen in history and the fact that we see that come about. But if you, back, if you roll back a little bit, do you think Nebuchadnezzar was thinking about that last kingdom? Was he real concerned about that? Or any of the other people? They, were, they may have been interested, anxious, wondering, but they knew it was going to be after Nebuchadnezzar and after the next guy and the next guy and so forth. So um, it's, it's, uh, that's one of my favorites. But they're not really freestanding stories. They're really a continuum of these guys' lives and what happens with them and how they interact. And so if we just start in the beginning, it's, we just start with Daniel in the first chapter. What we see is um, we see in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And then he took people and he took them back. And down in uh, verse 3, it says, Then the king commanded Aspenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without, youth without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, and endowed with knowledge and understanding. And down in verse 5, among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, of the tribe of Judah, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we have then have the story about them re not wanting to eat the king's food because it was not what God wanted them to eat. And Daniel is the one that kind of spearheads this, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are right there buying into it. They all go with the eat what we're supposed to eat plan, and they eat according to what God has put before them. And so they are working right from the beginning from a position of faith, okay? There is no reason for them to not just say, well, here we are, you know, pass the pork, you know, because they are in a tough spot. They have been brought by force to somewhere they didn't want to go and they're being put in a position they didn't want to be in, but they are not afraid. Not in the sense that we think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? They're not rebelling. They're not trying to go back. They are saying, this is where I am. This is what I do. And this is how I keep myself in line with God, even though this is not really all that great. And then what happens is they get in uh, good with the king. And so uh, they, are, um, they are favored. Down in verse 19 of verse 1, and the king spoke with them, and among them, None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Kind of reminds you of the three musketeer, musketeers and D'Artagnan kind of deal. But there's the four of them. And he says, therefore, they stood before the king and in a matter, in, excuse me, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were, were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. 
Isn't that a, a spoiler alert? You know, here's Daniel. He's one of these guys that's been drug over from Jerusalem. And here we find that, oh, he is going to outlive Nebuchadnezzar. Kind of tells you something about what, what's going to be happening. In, 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 uh, but anyway, he, they are all placed in, in a good position. Then that you have the, the beginning of the story of, the, of his dream. And he has this dream, and he dreams the dream of this image. And then he says, I want somebody to tell me the dream and then tell me the meaning. And, you know, everybody is looking at each other. You can just see the, 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 his, his counselors all scratching their heads and saying, Hey, this, is, this isn't going to work. This, you know, tell us. Just tell us. And so he gets ready to kill them all. And Daniel says, you know, he and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego pray about this. Because he, br he brings them into the picture and he says, hey, look, here's, here's what's going on. And then he goes before the king and he interprets the dream for him. He tells him the dream and that he interprets the dream. And how does that work for him? Is that good? Is that good for Daniel? Is that good for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? Yeah, that's good. What happens? Well, after he interprets the dream, okay, uh, what we see down in the end of chapter 2 is... Um, then the king gave Daniel on, high honors and made great gifts uh, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego over the affairs of the province. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So these guys have come from, you know, bad situation. And now through just being solid, living according to what God wants them to do, giving God the credit. Daniel never takes one speck of credit for himself. He continually is going back and saying, it's not through my wisdom. It is through God, the Most High God. And now it's an interesting turn of events because... How did Nebuchadnezzar feel coming out of uh, that session where he's told this dream? Is he feeling pretty good about himself? Yeah. I mean, the, the, this guy who obviously is some kind of connection with this almighty God is telling him he is, he's the, he is the cat's meow. He is the head of gold. He is really uh, in charge of the birds and the bees and the, you know, the, animal, the beasts and he's been given this huge kingdom and it's been through the most high God. And he, he, he burns incense to David, or Daniel and he does say your most high God is, you know, he, he gives him some credit, but he kind of fudges on it right off the bat. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is, is Nebuchadnezzar living in fear? I don't think so. Nebuchadnezzar is living in no fear because he has power. And so at this point, he is feeling pretty good about himself. And you can almost see him as, the, they, as he's given the interpretation of the dream. You know, he's all on board with the first part. And then probably something like when you see uh, one of the Charlie Brown films or cartoons, and at some point the adult says something and it goes, meow, 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 you know. And so you can kind of hear him. You can kind of see him listening until the part where it says, and the guy after you is not going to be as influential as you are. 
and then he's all on board with this. So here he is, and this is just a continuation. There's really not a chapter break here. It's a, just a continuation. So King, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. Why is he doing that? Because he thinks he's pretty cool. Not only that, but this most high God is the one who pointed him out, you know, endorsed him. And if we look, it says, he set it up in the plain of Dura, and uh, then Nebuchadnezzar sent to the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers uh, and the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to come to do the dedication of the image that, that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so this idea that he had set it up is repeated, you know, over and over and over again. And so when he is now threatened, he's now confronted by these three guys, and they are living in no fear. He's living in no fear. They're not afraid, but where they, why are they not afraid? Well, they're not afraid because they know God is on their side. He's, afraid, he's not afraid because he thinks he's pretty good stuff. He's got it. Well, he's not really, at this point, thinking about we're all going to die, apparently. And he can hand out death, but he's got the whole world in his hand. And so he's living in this model where he's not afraid. They're not afraid because they uh, know it's all about God. They've had no fear from the beginning. They were, uh, the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought in uh, with Daniel uh, early on. And they were not, but they were not lacking for comforts. And at this point, they had a lot to lose. If you think about where they were, um, you can see them saying, well, maybe if I got down on one knee and sort of only, you know, just, just enough to make the king not get angry. But they are accused and they are pointed out specifically because of their faith and because they are living a particular kind of life. It's not a one-off thing. It's not the beginning of the story that they won't give in to the king. It is a continuation of the story. It is where they have been and what they have been doing. And they have been living with their hearts, with their minds and hearts pointed towards God. And that's why they can be accused. If they hadn't been living that way, then the other guys here who say, um, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They're playing to his ego. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. And he says to them, you do not serve my gods or worship the image that I have set up. Okay? I set it up. He's the main man, and he's not afraid, and he thinks they should be afraid of him. Okay? So uh, they make the statement that we've talked about. The God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. It's a continuation of where they've been. Nebuchadnezzar's in a fury again, and it's all about him. It's all about him. And so he throws them into the furnace. They are unscathed, and he comes out and he says, the ne then Nebuchadnezzar came to the door of the burning furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And so they come out, and it looks like we got a turn of events. You know, you think about this, Nebuchadnezzar has 
um, had this circumstance with the first dream, and it was astounding. But he is so entrenched in himself and in his own power that he sets aside this Most High God and sets up his own gods, and then he starts to make these guys who are living in key or in tune with the Most High God and who are living righteous lives and living out of, uh, without, without fear in a different way. It's, it's too much for him, so he wants to get rid of them. But he comes, he, he is, he is uh, still now, he comes back around and he said, says, um, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has set his angel up and delivered his servants, who trusted him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve the worship and worship any god other than that, their god. Then I, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language speaks anything against the God of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego shall be torn limb for limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, provi in, in the province of Babylon. So he sees, but somehow he feels like God still needs his help, you know? I'm going to say, if this, then this. I'm going to be all over it on this um, with regard to this most high God. He, need, he needs me, okay? And I'm going to do these things, and this is going to be, you know, uh, I mean, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be good. Okay. And so, he, down in chapter 4, it says, in verse 2, it says, It seemed good to me to show, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking, to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. This is what he's done for me. Okay? And so, he then sets about um, praising God because he has done things and he has endorsed me. See what he's done for me? And then down, we have this, the next dream. And the next dream is kind of uh, a little different. Okay? It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace, and I saw a dream that made me afraid as I lie on the bed, and the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me and make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And then the magicians and the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers came in and told, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known me its interpretation. At last Daniel came in before me, uh, he who was called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God. He even, he even names Daniel after his God, after all that this has happened, he's still hanging that moniker on Daniel. He says, I know, and he says, I know the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And now he's deflected back or he's returned back to this holy gods thing. Okay? It's not the most high God, it's the holy gods. He's got, you got an in with whoever it is. And he says, uh, and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretations. And he says, he said, the visions of my head as I lay in the bed were these that I saw. And behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and, and its top stretched to heavens, and it was visible to the whole earth. And the leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and it was, it was food for all. And the beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of heaven that lived in its branches, and all flesh fed from it fed from it. I saw in the vision of my head as I lay in bed, say that ten times fast, and behold a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven, and he proclaimed aloud, thus, chop down the tree, and lop off its branches, and strip off the leaves, and scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it, 
and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its, of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth, let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him, and the sentence by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones is the end is, is excuse me, the holy ones, to the end that the living may know the most high God. So there's this dream, and the whole point is for whoever it's represented by, for him to come to know the most high God, not just some God. And so uh, Daniel is, uh, uh, says it w he was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him because, you know, the first dream he told the king, the king was all over that, right? He was great. This is good for him. Now he's looking at this, and he knows he's got to give the king uh, bad news. And so he tells the old king, it is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord the king, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You, sh you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over till you, till you know the Most High God rules the kingdom of men. And so you would think that Nebuchadnezzar's knees would maybe turn a little bit to jello. He'd be kind of a little bit worried. I mean, he's already had all of this interaction with these four guys who are immovable, who are absolutely immovable. Okay. We don't know a lot about what else they did, but we do know that they were faithful and that they were immovable when it came to serving God. And so, but uh, then down here in verse 28, it says, and we're in chapter 4, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. But first, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace, and the king answered and said, hmm, is, this, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal presence for the glory of my majesty? He hasn't learned a thing. He hasn't learned a thing. All of this that he's gone through, and now he hears this last dream and the interpretation of the last dream, and maybe he was a little shook up, but by the end of a year, okay, by the end of 12 months, he's already back and saying, ah, well, you know, I guess, you know, that, that didn't happen, so look at, look at what I did. Look at what I built. And while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O Nebuchadnezzar, to you it's spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know the Most High God rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from among men, and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with dew, till his hair grew long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, and now Nebuchadnezzar relates, I lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned, and I blessed the Most High God, and praised him, and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of the heaven and among the inhabitants of, inhabitants of earth. And none can say, can stay his hand or say, what have you done? And then down in, and at the same time, my reason returned to me, 
to the glory of my kingdom. My majesty had splendor, had returned. My counselors, my lords, sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. So now he has come to the point where he has been completely humbled, and he turns to God. Now, and that's where the story ends. Next thing we know, we're into the king uh, Belshazzar and the finger writing on the wall. Nebuchadnezzar's out of the picture. Daniel continues on. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we don't know any more about. But we know this. There is this continual, this, continu this building of a storyline. There is a building, a showing and comparing of two lines of thought. One of them is no fear because God is my God. And no fear because I'm pretty tough stuff. You know? And if we look in our world, there are the people that are consumed by the concept of being in control. And we already know who's in control. And that's why we don't have to have fear, because we know. However it turns out, it'll be, it'll be OK. So we have the two models, no fear based on ego and no fear, no fear based on uh, acting in God's shadow and living with courage, because we know, because we know So we say, so, you know, I say, where am I? Well, I know where I want to be. And so it's a conscious decision that we work on. I mean, stuff happens in our lives, and we do get anxious. And it is a conscious decision to be different. To be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, it was great when they were doing well, and then it wasn't so great when they got in the furnace, and then it was they were doing well, and you know, in the end, we don't know exactly what happened to those guys, but I know what I know. We know what they knew. It's okay. It's okay because they had that kind of an abiding faith. That's what we want. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we know that you have uh, given us your word and you have given us uh, that different pictures into your thinking. Sometimes things that are fairly clear and we can see and we can understand and sometimes things we have to think hard about but Lord, in all of those things, we pray that we might look to you and that we might not try to always figure out what you want um, or why things are the way they are, but rather to look and see what you would want us to do in the situation that we're in and that we build our faith up and that our faith is built up as we worship together and work together. And we just pray that we might, at the end of our lives, be able to say that we have lived in the shadow of God and walked righteously. And just bless us as we gather this evening, as through Christ we pray. So that's where we end tonight. And I would just uh, add that we're going to have a song in a minute. And if you have been living in fear, and you want to make it different by accepting Christ as your Savior, having your sins removed in baptism, and joining the saints who are attempting to walk in the shadow of God, uh, then we'd encourage you to come as we stand and sing.